Renegades of Rotation, it's Prof G, and in this lesson we're going to learn how to update our user interface so that it appears that we've centered the last row in a lazy v-grid, something that isn't out of the box easy to do in Swift UI. And we'll also learn how to detect and respond to a device rotation and reflow our user interface so it looks good with that new orientation. And we'll learn about methods drop last and suffix while using geometry reader on change and on appear. We'll even throw in a calculation with a percentage sign remainder operator for good measure. Let's get into position for big learning. Now it's surprising that SwiftUI doesn't have an easy way to simply center the items that don't fill up the last row in a lazy V grid or the last column in a lazy H grid, but that feature is not available. It probably will be someday since this is a pretty basic thing that developers want to do, but for now we can show you how to work around this limitation. What we'll do is we'll figure out the maximum number of items that fit in a single row of a lazy V grid for the current device's size. Then we'll flow all the items that evenly divide into that maximum number of items per row using the standard lazy V grid. But we won't pass into the lazy V grid those items from this less than full row. What we'll do instead is take this last less than full row and we'll put it in a centered H stack. That'll make things look like this and it'll work perfectly. And if you wanted to do this with a lazy H grid instead of a lazy V grid, the same techniques would apply. Just everything that's horizontal will be vertical and vice versa. Now to get this to work, we need to perform some basic math, and whenever I need to calculate coordinates like this, I usually draw things out on paper or on a screen so I can get a sense of what I need to work with. So hopefully this diagram helps you understand what we need to do. So to calculate the number of items, in this case buttons, per row, we first get the width of the device. And in an earlier lesson, we learned how to do this using SwiftUI's Geometry Reader. And then we want to subtract any horizontal padding from the device width, since our items, our buttons in this case, won't flow into the padding. Then we take this amount, that would be the value represented by light blue in here, and that's the total amount of space that our items, our buttons, can fill up. And then we divide this by the width of an item, a button in our case, plus any spacing between those items. Now there's actually one less space between the buttons than there are buttons, so we'll have to account for that too. We can just add one space between items to our calculation for the light blue area. This will give us the value that we need. Now if we convert the result of this calculation to an int, we can get rid of any remainder, any decimals, and we'll have the whole number of items, meaning buttons in our case, that we can fit in a row. Now once we know how many items we can fit in a row, how do we know how many items are left over? Well, Swift has a remainder function. It's the percentage sign. Don't confuse this with percentages though, it returns a remainder value, not a percentage value. Most programming languages have this as well. It's often called modulo in other programming languages. But what it does is it returns the value that's left over after dividing one number into another. So for example, seven percentage sign or seven remainder operator three equals one. Since three goes into seven two times, which we don't care about, but we have one left over, which we do care about, that's what's returned by this function. Eight percentage sign or eight remainder function three gives us a two, since we have two left over. Nine remainder function three gives us a zero, because we don't have any remainder since three divides evenly by nine. So we can use this to get the number of items that are left over in our less than full row. Then we can use a lazy grid to display all the items except that last incomplete row. And to do this, we're gonna use a new method called drop last. We'll use that to drop the number of items on our last line when we go through our for each statement. So we won't put these last items in a lazy V grid, but then we can populate a centered H stack using a function called dot suffix on our array that will get the last items in the array, passing in just the number of items in our last line. This is gonna give us the result that we have right here. So let's code this up. So first we need to add a geometry reader so we can get the screen width. So above the V stack, I'm gonna enter geometry reader, upper camel case, press return, and I'll call the value that we pass in, which is a Swift UI type called geometry proxy, as just geo, lowercase. Then I'm gonna take my entire V stack and I'm gonna paste it between the geometry reader's curlies. I'll code fold the V stack just to make sure that I'm getting it all. And then when I paste it back in, the code folding unfolds. Now I'm gonna perform my calculation when the V stack first appears. So I'm gonna add an on appear modifier to the V stack. This padding modifier is on the V stack, so I'll just add it below this. And remember, on appear is gonna execute when this view appears. So essentially when the app first runs. And I don't need the parens in here, but I do need open and close curlies. That's where I'm gonna put the code that's going to execute when this view appears. And now I wanna calculate how much space is available to lay out my buttons. So I'm gonna call this value screen width, even though it's a little bit less than the screen width. It'll be var screen width. I'll set that equal to geo, which is the geometry reader that we pass in, dot size dot width. So that gives us the width of the device. And then I'm gonna subtract the amount of padding, and that's the padding that'll be on both sides of the V stack. 
Now, I wish there was a way to read in the default padding value, but apparently there isn't yet in Swift UI. Again, hopefully someday there will be, but in most cases, the default padding value is 16, so I'll just use that. And it's often a good idea to create constants for values like this, since it'll make my code easier to read instead of just having to look at the value 16 and wonder, hey, what is that? And I could put the constants inside of the onAppear method, but I find it easier to put all of the constants that I use up to the top of my struct, so I'm gonna put them up here, just underneath where I create my state variables, declaring constants up here here also gives them struct-wide scope, making them available outside the onAppear closure, and that's what I want for some of these constants. So I'll call this first constant let horizontal padding, since it'll be for the horizontal padding, and I'll set this equal to 16. Now I'm going to use this number in the iOS coordinate system, and one thing that's important when you work with coordinates in Apple products is you need to use CG float. This CG float is a legacy type, it means core graphics. It actually predates Swift, so it predates Swift's double type. If you were ever referring to something where you needed to have CG float, don't worry, Xcode would remind you, but it's a good idea to remember. If you're ever referring to numbers that refer to individual coordinates, values. Usually this also applies to distances like widths and heights in the iOS coordinate system. In most cases, you're going to need this to be of type CG float. So just after horizontal padding, I'll say colon CG float, capital C, capital G, capital F. And while I'm here, I'm going to create some other constants. So I'll say let spacing colon CG float equal zero. And this is the spacing between buttons. Now in our app, we'll have no spacing between buttons, but if you wanted to change this, you could just update this constant. Then in the next line, we'll say let button width. I know in the previous slides I said item width, but I think button width makes it a little bit easier to read this code. So button width colon, that's also CG float, and that's equal to 102. Then I can use some of these values, so I'm going to copy the button width, and I'm going to head down to where I set up my lazy grid, and my minimum value, instead of saying 102 in here, I'm just going to paste in button width. And while I'm at it below the button, I'm going to create a frame modifier dot frame, and I'm going to pass in a width of button width. And now we can finish off our screen width calculation down below. I'm going to subtract horizontal padding, but I'm going to multiply it by two since I have 16 points of padding on either side. And now next I'm going to count for any spacing that's in between my items, in between my buttons. And remember there's one less amount of spacing than there are the number of buttons that you're going to use. So I'm going to create an if statement in here to account for that. I'll say if capital D dice dot all cases, lower camel case dot count is greater than one, then in between curlies I'll say screen width plus equal spacing. By adding an additional spacing here, then I can just go ahead and add the spacing value to the end of the length of the button, our button width, and we have a spacing value of zero in here. But if we had a spacing value in here, we can use this to get the right number of items, buttons in our case, plus spacing that will fit in the available space. Now I want to calculate the number of buttons per row as an int. So I'm going to say let number of buttons per row equals, then I'll say int in parentheses, passing in my screen width. And what that's going to do is it's going to convert the screen width to an int. Remember, it's initially a CG float. It is possible that CG floats, by the way, have decimals, so this will drop all the decimals. Then I'm going to divide this by int, and in between parens, this will be button width plus spacing. So by dividing an int by an int, this is going to drop any remainder. It's going to drop any decimal values that I have in here. And I'm going to have a nice whole number, which represents the maximum number of buttons that I can fit on a given row. And this will give us a value that we can use to calculate the number of remaining buttons that can't fill a whole row. So we'll call this value buttons left over, and we'll create a state variable to hold this value at state private var buttons left over equals zero initially. And I'll put in a comment saying that this is the number of buttons in a less than full row, then we'll calculate this in on appear saying buttons left over equals capital D dice dot all cases, lower camel case dot count, then percentage sign. Remember, this is the remainder operator, num of buttons per row. So the remainder value we get here will be the number of buttons that can't divide evenly when we divide number of buttons into dice all cases count. That's the number of buttons we're going to have in the last line. Option clicking on buttons left over confirms this is indeed an int value. And if you want to, you can also print out the number of buttons per row and the number of buttons left over. You don't need to do this, but I tend to put lots of print statements in my code as I'm working on things just to make sure that I'm getting the values that I expect. So now that we got our buttons left over, these lonely guys in the last row, in this example, it's only one button, the 100-sided button. I'll highlight and copy buttons left over. I'm going to head up to my for each statement. Now remember, we no longer want the for each to go through all of the elements. We want to drop those lonely guys in the last line that aren't in a complete line. So what I'm going to do is use a method that's new to us right after the all cases part in the for each statement here. I'm going to enter dot 
drop last. Code completion says this returns a subsequence containing all but the specified number of final elements, so it'll drop those last elements. Press return to accept this, and in between the parens, I'm gonna paste in the buttons left over, so those won't be part of my lazy V grid. And you can see in the live preview that I now have two rows with a max number of buttons in each. I've dropped that last lonely button, the 100-sided button. By the way, I don't have any spacing in my adaptive grid item. Now we do want to add the spacing variable in here, even though we set it to zero. So in between the two parentheses that are just before the closing square bracket, I'm going to put in a comma, and I know I'm in the right place because when I start typing spacing in, code completion recognizes this. I'll press return, and the variable that I created to hold my spacing value is just spacing. Now below the lazy V grid, let's add that H stack that will have that last lonely button. So after the curly that's after the button style in red tint, I'm gonna make some room here. Then I'm gonna enter H stack, open and close curlies. And inside I'll use a for each to create the remaining buttons. And for my data that I'm gonna be iterating over, I'm gonna enter capital D dice dot all cases, lower camel case. And I'm gonna use the dot suffix method here. Choose this one that says max length. Code completion says that this is gonna return the number of final elements in the collection. That's just what we want. Press return to accept this. So how many elements do we want in the suffix? How many elements do we want from all cases? Why, we just pass in buttons left over, of course. Then I'm gonna tab over and press return on the content to get the trailing closure. And just like in the value above, I'm gonna pass in a value dice, lowercase. And since I wanna create buttons, I'm gonna highlight my button code from the for each statement above, copy it, paste it in the for each statement below. Also make sure that you copy your button modifiers down here. And we've got one error in here since we're not conforming to the identifiable protocol, but we know how to fix this. This just means that we're not using an ID parameter in our for each, and we need one here. So we can go to the for each statement above, and I'm gonna copy from the comma through the end of self, and then I'm gonna paste it in the exact same location in the for each statement below between these parentheses, and yowza, will you look at that? We've got our lonely button in the less than full line, but centered nicely below the lazy V grid, and everything looks just as we'd hoped. Nice! Now we can test to see if things reflow with different dimensions if we have different item sizes. So I'm gonna head up to my button width constant and I'm gonna change the value there to 130. And look at that. Now we get three rows of two columns with one remaining button at the bottom. Cool. Now let's build and run in the simulator, and we'll notice one additional problem that we need to address. Well, all looks good in portrait mode, but when I press command arrow to rotate to the left in landscape mode, ah, look, the buttons aren't recalculated. The lazy V grid will flow the initial buttons it knew about, those six, but the sixth button really should be in the last row of the buttons that's in the H grid. Well, we can fix this by listening to see when the geometry reader has changed the width value. And when that has happened, when the width has changed, we have a new orientation, so we should rerun the same code that we have in on appear, and that'll trigger the lazy V grid and the H stack to put the buttons in the new locations where they belong. Let's make this happen. So just above dot appear in our code, we'll enter a new modifier, dot on change. Code completion says this fires an action when a specific value changes. So by looking for a change in the geometry readers with value, we'll know we have rotated the device. So press return to accept this. And for the of value in here, that's the value that we're watching for a change. We'll pass in geo, lowercase, dot size, dot width. Then I'll tab over, press return to enter the closure. We actually won't use this new value that we're passing in here, but let's highlight and copy all of the code between the curlies in on appear below. We'll paste it between the curlies of the on change modifier we just added, and now we'll calculate our button layout when the V stack first appears and anytime the width changes. So let's press play and run in the simulator. And oh cool, the simulator kept the orientation landscape and we see the buttons are now in the correct spot. I'm gonna press command arrow key to rotate back to the portrait orientation. And look at this, the buttons reflow from the prior two buttons that were at the bottom to the current layout with only one button on the bottom row. Nice, just what we wanted. Now this is working great, but we are violating our dry principles. Don't repeat yourself, since we have repeated code here. This calls for some refactoring. So I'm gonna go and highlight all of the code in on appear cut this out, then just before the closing curly in the struct, I'm gonna make a little bit of room here and create a new function, func, and I'll call this arrange grid items, lower camel case, as all functions should be. I'll initially pass in no values in here, so just open and close parentheses, but we'll change this, then open and close curlies. I'm gonna paste in the on appear code that I just cut out, 
Then in between the unappear curlies, I'm gonna call the arrange grid items function that I just created. Then I can delete all the code that's inside of on change above this and call arrange grid items in there too. Now I do get one error because the value geo, the value of the type geometry proxy that we created in the geometry reader, doesn't have the scope in this new function. So Xcode says it can't find it in scope. It has no idea what geo is down here. The function can't use it, but this is easy to remedy. All I need to do is pass in a variable of type geometry proxy, and I can use that. So in between the parentheses, when we define our function arrange grid item, I'm gonna enter geo, that's the parameter that I'm going to be passing into this function, then colon and the type of this value, the type is geometry proxy, that's upper camel case like all types, now, I remember that from early on in this lesson when I created the geometry reader. Unfortunately, Xcode's option click on geo isn't showing that this is a geometry proxy type. But if you enter geometry reader again, you would be able to see the variable types that are associated with this. And you can verify that it is indeed a geometry proxy type. So that's all I need to do to set up this function so that I can pass in a geo variable of type geometry proxy. Now, let's change what we call the functions in two places so that we're actually passing that value in. So if I just backspace over the parens in the function call here, then I enter the opening parens. Xcode will offer to enter the new argument label for geo. I'm gonna press return and I'm gonna pass in geo because that's the name of the variable I wanna pass in here. And I'll modify the other arrange grid items call the same way, passing in the geo value. Errors go away. I can click on the play button to build and run in the simulator. And if you look in the console, you can see that those print statements that I put in, print number of buttons per row as two, number of buttons left over as one. That's exactly what we're seeing in the simulator. If I command arrow to rotate the simulator, we see two new lines are printed out. Number of buttons per row is now five, buttons left over are two. So this is working great. We can see that it's re-executing that code verified by these print statements that I have down here, and it's reflowing the buttons with the correct number of buttons we want. Now you can delete these print statements if you don't want them in your code anymore. And it's always a good idea to simulate your app on different size devices to make sure everything's working okay. Let's take a look at the ninth generation iPad, a very large device. And when this runs, we see five buttons up top, two buttons in the second row, rotate this with a command arrow key, all the buttons are in the bottom row. These are, by the way, all in the H stack, not in the lazy V grid. And if I set my button width back in my code, back to the original 102 value that I was using, then press play and run in the simulator again, I can see now that this shows all the buttons in the bottom row in either orientation. Very nice. So Swifter, we learned some more advanced concepts. We leveraged a geometry reader. We used two new methods, drop last and suffix. And we used a combination of on appear to get the layout when the app first runs and on change to monitor the geometry readers with property to trigger calculations in a new layout if the orientation of the device changes. And we use the remainder operator. So feel good about those skills, Swifter. In our final Dungeon Dice lesson, we're gonna do just a bit of refactoring and that's gonna set us up for cleaner code organization when we create more complex apps to come. Keep hacking.